My name is Georgine O'Neill. I'm part of UCD Teaching and Learning. Um, and we really wanted to do some sessions around designing online quizzes, really because we have moved in UCD, I suppose, with, with COVID, we've much more online, and a lot of people are trying these out for different purposes. Um, so this is the reason why we decided to have this getting started in designing online quizzes, and we have a follow-up one coming on, sort of improving designing online quizzes. So we're delighted to be able to invite um, Professor Sally Jordan. And just to tell you a little bit about Sally, uh, Sally is, is a professor in physical edu uh, physics education, sorry, not physical, physics education <laughs> at UK Open University uh, with 30 years experience of teaching and supporting distance learning students. She's the first person in the university to incorporate online computer marked assessments into her teaching about 20 years ago. And this was driven by a desire to, to provide more um, feedback uh, and to motivate students. She's held faculty and university wide leadership roles, including in assessment, and her research interests are in the use of these sophisticated computer marked assessments, also interested in the impact of assessment on students, on um, equality, diversity, and inclusion, very topical. Uh, subjects at the moment. Um, however, she will admit she's not a technical expert um, and she sees herself primarily as a higher education teacher. So I'm delighted to be able to hand over to you, Sally, um, for, for this. It's a one and a half hour session. Okay, thanks, Sally. Geraldine, thank you very much indeed. And hello, everyone. Um, so just as, as Geraldine said, the one thing I would possibly add is that um, I did a lot of work in this area, um, I, you know, when it was really very new to us at the UK Open University. Um, and I've also got research interests, so I have sort of researched the impact on, on, on our students. Um, you could say that because I've been doing other kind of management roles for the last seven years, I'm a bit out of date. Um, you could also say that's given me a more reflective and perhaps more critical approach. And I think you'll probably see that. But just to emphasize again, I'm not a technical expert. I never have been. I've been the sort of academic concern, not the not the whiz kid. Um, and in particular, we use a different virtual learning environment. We use Moodle. Um, I have um, been in conversation with um, some of the people from UCD about the functionalities of Brightspace and I've also spent a fair bit of time watching their training videos. So I'll try not to mislead you, but I can't answer qu technical questions about Brightspace. This is more generic and I believe there will also be follow up workshops if you do want that sort of more technical expertise. Just one of the housekeeping thing before I get going. Um, I'm going to try really hard. I'm watching chat and, that, you know, please, please, please do engage with us in that way. And there'll be other ways of engaging as well. Um, and as Geraldine has said, do do sort of introduce yourself because it's quite useful just to know the background of people who are who are with us. Um, but I'll try not to use your name um, when I'm talking because of the recording so that, that you know, the, the chat is, is between us, uh, whereas when I've mentioned things, I'll try not to not to use your name. So to move on, um, that's a bad failure to start with. The focus is in the wrong place on the screen. There we go. Um, so to move on, the this is what I said we'd do, and it is by and large what I think we will do. Um, we're basically looking at the advantages and disadvantages of online quizzes and perhaps significantly what we can do to make them better. Um, and we're very much thinking from the sort of assessment design point of view, how can you actually incorporate those quizzes into your assessment strategy? And then we'll start on the basis of good question design. Um, I will revisit all of those themes in one way or another in the second webinar, which is on the 16th of November. So first of all, there is a, an issue here with language, um, and I just want to make it absolutely clear what we're talking about and what we're not talking about. So those words on the screen, e-assessment, technology enhanced assessment, computer based assessment, get banded around. Now, I use those three term, these three phrases, um, slightly different meaning each of them, but basically they are around any use of a computer to help you in assessment. 
So that might be, I don't know, using a, um, a blog or something in teaching. It might be using video feedback. Um, it might be simply using an electronic management system to um, receive and return um, scripts from students that, that you're marking by hand. Um, so it includes online quizzes, but it's not doesn't narrow it down sufficiently. So the next word again that, that gets used is computer marked assessment. Now we're getting closer because the clue, clue there is in the fact that the, the, the if you like the computer is doing the marking or not. Um, but that again doesn't quite get there because um, those of you that are old like me will remember the old fashioned sort of multiple choice questions where you pencil in a square to say what your and what the right answer is and then send it off to somebody. Um, and we're talking about something that's that's much more interactive. So what we could say we're down on is online computer mark assessment. We're doing it, the marking is happening in real time uh, and potentially the students getting feedback. And for that reason, we actually use the terminology at the OU, um, interactive computer marked assignments. Now, ICMAs, I'm only really telling you that because in some of the student feedback, they will use that terminology and I will use that terminology. We do also use the terminology quizzes, and particularly when we're talking about the sort of form, more formative function. So this is where we go over to you. Geraldine, you couldn't read for me that. Sure, bottom, yeah, I can bottom, read them. For, could you read the bottom them? left yeah. blue one? Yeah, sure. So I, I can read them off you, no problem. No, it's the fine. Bottom, I can see most of them, I think. Yeah. So the bottom blue is advantage conducted in secure environment, less oh. paper, admin, can be marked automatically depending on the question type. Okay, yeah, nice. Great. No, that's nice. That's really nice. Thank you. And I can read a few more if you like, Sally, will I? No, it's fine. I think I'm yep. okay. Um, okay. That's fine. So we've got good performative work, flexibility of location, quick feedback, um, good for reinforcing learning. That's like, that's really nice. Standardized, that's, that's a good one. Um, and then there's also, I think we've got the, you know, the, the main points that that I've got on my sheet there. Um, I've lost the one that, yeah, I like this idea that you can evaluate your session. You can actually see how students do on the quiz. So you're learning things and you can, you can in fact, there's a little bit more than that. Um, I'll talk more about that in the second session, but you can get quite sort of detailed understanding in principle, at least about what your students are doing. Um, somebody else has got monitor student understanding of the material, which is essentially the same thing. So there's lots and lots of advantages there and um, can be taken anywhere. Yeah, indeed they can. So it's quite funny, actually, when we've watched our students doing them, we used to get really, really surprised by the number of people doing them in the middle of the night. I don't know that we've ever quite quite bottomed out, whether it's different time zones, because obviously we, we work across the world or whether it's the students do things in the middle of the night. I think it's possibly a bit of both. Um, John, Dean, you couldn't go on to disadvantages, could you? Sure. Yes. Oh, yeah. Wow. Now that's that's really really good. So yeah, oversimplifies the subject. Excellent. This is really good. Um, I'm I'm very pleased by the fact that you're identifying um, difficulty. Um, this is true. Um, the impersonal thing as well is interesting. I mean. You know, it can be true. You can think of them as easy and quick. You can think of them as, as difficult. And I'll, I'll explore that a little bit more. Um, do all students have technical means to take the quiz? That's a very, very important one. Online fatigue. Um, reliance on the Internet, technical setup issues. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's interesting, this reliance on the Internet. We I think we've always had a tendency to do things maybe a little bit too soon. Um, when we first used these things 20 years ago, um, we, we'd waited till we thought we could rely on people being able to access the internet from wherever. Um, I think we might have just leapt a little bit too soon. Um, that's brilliant. Geraldine, I think that's probably, oh, and <laughs> copy and paste from Dr. Google. Absolutely, this, this um, collusion plagiarism, um, let's call it cheating. I will revisit because I've, I've been alerted to that. Um, we'll only look at certain types of learning. 
um, you know, this, this potential for it to be, um, you know, fairly surface level. Um, yep, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Okay, I think that's lovely. Thank you. Stop the show. Let's get back to the other one just in case okay. there's anything I missed, but that's, uh, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. And I'll just say that if people can, can keep those, um, stickies from the keep the because the link is there for you if you want to have them keep the the advantages and disadvantages so thank okay. you very much for that okay. and i've got, got that as well so that that's great right. so i'm going to go back to sharing my screen so hopefully that's come through now and i'm just opening the chat box as well so i can see you so can i just confirm geraldine could you just yeah great yeah screen? can see oh, great perfect thank yeah Right, so let's see how what you arrived at together compares with what the ones that I had, if you like, thought of earlier. So um, potentially there's a time saving thing. Um, this can be used time and time again. It actually um, is something to think about in two senses. Um, students can potentially do these things as many times as you want them to so they can use them to sort of you know quick and easy reinforcement and of course you can as well um, and that will become relevant in a minute I'll, I'll talk through that why I'm saying that um, I always think this constructive alignment thing is perhaps a little bit dodgy because online quizzes aren't terribly like anything else that you're doing but it is a reason that's given, so I've written it there. Um, they can make marking more consistent. Um, that, those, you know, the things I was talking about earlier where you pencil off the square, those are called objective tests. And the reason that language was used was that they were believed to be really, really consistent. Um, and even when you're marking more sophisticated things, um, it's, in a sense, it's the question setter who's, who's determining the way they mark. Um, but it is one person, it's not, it's not got that variability. Humans are pretty fallible when it comes to marking. Um, we've got the quick, the practice, motivation, and the point that, you know, well done. The point that I wasn't sure that people would get because they don't always is this diagnosing student misunderstandings. So if I move on to what I got as disadvantages, um, surface approach, authenticity, um, and down the bottom there, you know, my subject doesn't have right or wrong answers. Um, my subject, physics, tends to. Um, incidentally, it's definitely physics, not physics education, not physical science. Um, uh, but uh, there are subjects where it's, it's more challenging. And it can be very annoying when you get something and it, and it, it you know, it assumes that there are single right and wrong answers and there aren't. Um, a couple of things in there as well. You've got the writing might be difficult and therefore time consuming and therefore expensive. Um, we've got the cheating um, point in, in various ways, which, which again, I'll come back to. A um, couple of ones in there, in the middle there. Um, it relates to this authenticity. It's relatively easy to mark the final answer that's given. So if it's in a calculation, if you like, it's the, it's the answer to the, to the sum. Um, if it's, if you're marking something that's, um, it, that, that, okay, okay. If, if you're doing something in a more, in a less numerate discipline, it's, if you like, the logic. You tend to be marking what you've got shown in front of you. In fact, it's perfectly easy to mark essays. But again, are you actually marking the real, the real, you know, communication skills of writing an essay? It's, it, it, you know, there's issues there to do with what it is you're actually marking, which again, I'll explore more next time. And this thing about no tutor to in, interpret the student's answer. Um, what I'm talking about there is that when we're, usually when we're doing assessment, there's a person, if you like, involved between the student and the assignment. Um, in this instance, there isn't. And so um, that can mean a student doesn't quite know what it is you're getting at, um, or perhaps you don't quite know what it is they're getting at. So there's just a need to be, to be careful. So rather than going on about this, um, 
I thought I'd actually use some quotes from some students when we first introduced these things. Um, they thankfully weren't both my students, they weren't both on things I did. Um, and you can read the words if you like. I'm just going to highlight some of the phrases. Um, I thought it was really unfair. I found them petty. Everything was correct apart from what I got marked wrong on and I missed the, the point. So in that instance, we had some pretty unhappy students. However, further analysis of it showed that the students were put off by the detail of particular things in particular questions, which are actually fixable. It wasn't the use of online quizzes per se that they didn't like. Um, and these were more positive things. Now, I should emphasize that this thing that we introduced, the first thing we introduced was actually a high stakes summative quiz. It was an interesting high stakes summative quiz. Um, it was one where students could repeat the questions um, and they got feedback. I was bowled over when students started telling me that doing a high stakes summative quiz was fun. It's not a sort of language that I'm used to experiencing in that kind of environment. Um, and they basically appreciated it. There were the, the technical issues that I talked about before because of people who were having difficulty with access. To, you've mentioned it, you know, the, the accessibility issue of whether the, the internet provision that, that somebody has is not, is not sufficient. So it's definitely worth bearing in mind. Um, and they, they generally, the, the, from the tutor further down, that was a later use. We don't now tend to use them in a very high stakes way, um, but it was a, that the, the tutors were experiencing that there was sort of deep, quite deep learning really going on from them, although they weren't deep learning themselves. And you'll probably be beginning to see where I'm going with this, but before I do it, I'm just going to go to what some assessment experts have said. Um, so I'm sure you'll be aware of some of this literature. Um, assessment, any sort of assessment is a really, really powerful tool. It tends to be the thing that drives what's going on in learning, it tends to determine, like it or not, it tends to determine what, what our students do. And I find that um, that bottom quote really quite powerful. Summative assessment is in itself formative. It can't help but be formative. At issue is whether that formative potential of summative assessment is lethal or emancipatory. Does summative assessment exert its power to disrupt and control a power so possibly lethal that the student would may be wounded for life. It's a horrible thought. And if you go on from that, um, you'll get to this point here, which is that particularly with uh, where there is e-assessment, and that was actually used more generally of e-assessment, not just online quizzes, but it's a very sharp sword. What you know, that's the sort of thinking about the danger if you like, of e-assessment, because it's not got that tutor having a mediating influence. That, that's the reason it was considered that way. Um, and I'd like to look at it more that it's got both positive and elements. So by double-edged sword, I realise it's, it's, it's not a terminology everybody would know, but that it, it's got both, you know, potential to be good and potential to be bad. Um, where I'm driving at in all this is that not everything we do in the name of online assessment is the same. So I'm now going to go into a session and apologies, there's a wee bit too much of me talking in the next little bit, but that will alter. We'll, we'll take a break in a little while and then there will be um, an much more opportunity for you to engage. But the, the things that we might do to improve the quality. Um, First and foremost, it's thinking about why you're doing it. What is your purpose? Is it that you want to grade students quickly or is it that you want to um, you know, help them in their learning? 
either of those is fine. And actually, those words summative and formative, I'll just explore a little bit more in a minute. But you need to be sure why you're doing it. So um, I find the word summative and formative quite tricky. For the rest of the talk, I'm using summative to mean the marks count in some way. And again, I'll explore other options with this at the, the second workshop. Formative, I tend to use um, to mean it's there, to, it's assessment for learning, it's, it's purpose, it's primary purpose is to help our students. Um, we actually use, it's kind of the other way around from that, that quote that I gave earlier, a, a quiz whose purpose is formative when you're doing it because you want students to learn can actually carry a grading as well. Um, so if I'm talking about something that is um, doesn't carry a mark, I tend to use the terminology purely formative, but just be aware that that language is, is a weeny bit muddled sometimes. But anyway, enough of the, the sermon. Um, it's there. It's a think about, you know, just be aware why you're doing it, what, what your purpose is. Um, the other thing that's really important is to think about how this fits with your teaching. So that's both how it fits alongside when you're going to use them. You know, are you using them in class? Are you using them, if you like, for homework? Um, and how it also fits with the rest of your assessment. Um, there are various ways you can do this, um, but as I say, it's really just the kind of stopping and thinking before you leap into it. This important just to think about how the quiz as a whole operates. I'll come back onto this point in a little while. Um, but as well as what the questions are, there's a need to think about the quiz as a whole and how the questions function within the quiz. And there are various options to you available within Brightspace on that. Um, range of question types available. Um, you know, I think the Brightspace list is growing all the time, the functionality that's there. Um, so appropriate question types, not always all the same thing. Inevitably, write better questions. Um, I know it's, it's flippant, but it, it is really, really important. And this iterative design process is another one of the themes that I will probably come back to quite a lot, but in particular at the second workshop, which is um, sadly none of us get it right first time. I mean, I've this morning been dealing with an issue for a tutor mark assignment that, I, that I'd written where I was absolutely confident this question was absolutely fine. And then I realised there's a word missing in it, which means that students are misunderstanding what I mean. So just monitor it, monitor the use and be prepared to make changes. And the other thing is think at the programme level. Um, that's another theme I'll come back to. It can be really, really confusing to our students if um, you've got various modules going into a programme and one module with, with one academic chooses to work in one way and another one chooses to work in another way and they're just subtly different. So it is worth sort of doing this in, in consultation very much towards the um, wanting to support students. You talked about it, the motivation, the giving quick answers, giving quick feedback. Um, and what we've actually done, and it is not impossible in quite the same way, I don't think, within, within Brightspace, but it is possible to do something, is actually when students get something wrong, to explain to them why it's wrong and to give them a second opportunity, um, which is, is um, whichever of the um, sets of conditions for, for assessment, driving learning you, you choose to go with. That's, it is one of the Gibson Simpson criteria that you're actually giving students another go um, quickly. And my colleague Sheila Ross put it rather nicely. What we actually see ourselves as doing is, if you like, you probably don't want to be disturbed by your students 24 seven, but actually you can always be there. There can always be a tutor at the student's elbow. So that's where I came from. That was my driver early on. And that was the only way we could do it on the module that, that I was talking about. However, um, for that same module, we wrote these things in 2000, it ran for the first time in 2002. Um, it was painful. 
Um, we had to go through previous iterations, technology changed in 2004, so we had to change them all again. Um, but basically, eventually we got it right, and that same assignment was still in use in 2018, having been used by really quite large numbers of students. Um, unfortunately, my university didn't pay me for that time that they saved. If they had done, I think I'd probably be quite rich, but there you go. So moving on to the second point, which is how you integrate the assignments. And you're not really interested in how we do it, you know, because it is a very different context. But just to give you a feel for it, um, we do have, so this is a module that I've become chair of having just come back from being head of school in, in the summer. And it has these quizzes that you can see there, which um, sort of come regularly. So the students are getting regular quizzes as they study. Clearly we're working online, you probably won't be, but it's that keeping up that regular pattern. And each of those quizzes consists of a number of questions. They're not trivial, the quizzes in that particular quiz. Um, but, you know, so associated with unit three there, um, there were actually what, four questions, questions five to eight in quiz one. Um, and students were told, you know, now you've done that, now why don't you have a go at, at those quiz questions? Um, the other interesting thing, um, again, just to set you thinking about how, how and when you might use these things. Um, we have something called the um, Science Laboratory, which is a way of teaching practical science for students at a distance. There's these um, fairly authentic sort of apps that students can use, and they're represented there by the little boxes on the screen. And if, for example, I was wanting to use quizzes to assess something holistic, um, you know, that might use the, um, the arrow uh, radio telescope and the graph plotter um, and various other things, then obviously the, any sort of assessment that I ran would be holistic, it would sit at a broader level, it would sit above those, those apps. But if you're just wanting to use something that assesses, I don't know, the virtual petrographic microscope, which actually we have done, then you would put the quiz within the app so that it's close to the learning. So again, it's, it's thinking about all of those, um, how you embed it type things. Now, this is the bit that um, the, where, where it, it just needs a little bit of thought. So it's worth bearing in mind, and Moodle and Brightspace, I think, both work in the same way, that you have a quiz and you have questions that, are, that can exist separately, so you can use them in different places, but you can put into the quiz. But the way in which the quiz as a whole works, I'll explain what that means in a minute, and the way in which the questions within the quiz works are separate. So there's the questions that sits there, and that sits there, and then there's the way in which they work. So what might you want to think about? Well, do you want to allow your students one go at the quiz? Or do you want to give them several goes at the whole quiz? Or do you want to give them unlimited goes at the quiz? Those are your decisions. Now, I explained that um, this bit works in a slightly different way in Brightspace, but I believe that you can enable a function that means that if a student got a student wrong at the first go, you can give them another go. Do you want to do that? That's your choice. Do you want to give feedback? Now, Correct me if I'm wrong, please, somebody by the chat box, but I believe that for most question types, in, certainly, you could choose to give students some sort of feedback, be it at what level you need to think about. Um, by level, I mean, are you just saying the answer is right or wrong, or are you saying what's wrong with it? But you can choose to give that at the level of the option selected. Is it right or wrong? Um, you know, is that option right? And you could give more detailed feedback on that. You could give feedback to a student at the level of the whole question, and indeed you could give it at the level of the whole quiz. 
And this is the bit where really and truly it's worth just talking to your colleagues so that you're not doing something only to find a colleagues doing something subtly different because it's a bit confusing for students. So getting towards the time when we'll just take a short break. But I just want to begin to think about the question types that are available. And the first thing I'm going to do is just, most of these are fairly obvious and we'll look at some examples, but um, let's just think about what the actual options are that are available to you. So the first one is true or false, fairly obvious. Is this statement right? Is it wrong? Multiple choice questions. I think we all know what they are. Multiple select questions, what they are, I might accidentally call them multiple response questions. They're when you're saying to a student, you're not saying pick one of these options, you're saying either pick all of them that are true or pick the two that are true. We can talk about which of those you might want to do later on. Written response is uh, where people write something which isn't automatically graded. Um, short answer, um, I've done a huge amount of work with short answer questions. These are ones which are automatically graded where somebody answers, puts an answer as a word or potentially a sentence. So they're, they're putting their own, their own answer in. Multi short answer seems to be combining a couple of short answer questions. I'm not sure I understand it right. Fill in the blanks is actually very similar as well. It's where you give a sentence and you're asking students to suggest the word that goes in the sentence, but they operate really quite like short answer. Matching questions are where you've essentially got two lists of things and you're deciding which of those apply to which. So you might have, I don't know, um, a list of um, a list of books um, and a list of authors. So you might have, goodness knows why this particular one has just come to mind, um, you might have a list of books that includes the Pickwick Papers and a list of authors that includes various authors but includes Charles Dickens and you would use the drop down list to pick which one applied to which. Ordering is saying what order do things happen in? So did that happen before that or after that? Um, again, it's it's a different question type. Um, and the two which I suspect um, that they're relatively new within uh, Brightspace, I could be wrong, but they do look quite sophisticated. There's a remarkable amount of functionality in them. Anybody that is assessing a numerate discipline, and apologies for those of you who aren't, the arithmetic um, question type enables you to accept numerical answers, potentially with a range. So if you want to accept something between 2.5 and 3.5 as correct, you can do that. Or indeed, you could, you know, give different responses if it, it you know, might be nearly right if it's between two, if you want an answer of, of uh, three and they give, you know, 2.6. Um, you can also mark units. So if you want an answer of um, uh, 2.6 metres, then with care, you can do that. And the metres are marked using the same technology that's used in short answer questions. And you can also, um, coming back to that cheating point, you can also have the very easily have these fires so that not all students get the same numbers. You can set up a random range for them. And for those of you that like me are, are sort of on you know, engineering or, or physics type disciplines, um, the significant figures um, tool does all the same things, but also enables you to put something in scientific notation. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. Um, and it also will um, mark on whether or not the precision is right, whether you're given the right number of significant figures. I was quite impressed. There is one question type that if people want to use that I would like to see, but let's let's give bright space time um that's one that's based on computer algebra um to to actually do the marking of that sort of thing for you but but it, th there's a lot there that is available 
Now, that sort of questions, they break down into two types. There's ones that are um, free text entry where people are putting in the response themselves. Those collectively are called constructive response questions, as opposed to ones where you're picking options, which are selected response question types. And there's a couple of, um, there's a couple of, uh, you know, fairly old now um, analyses of how much different types are used. Um, the, the thing, the, 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 the thing that's not in brackets you know, are the global figures for Moodle users, um, it's a huge number of users. And you'll see that multiple choice questions are really very, very heavily used. Um, the one in brackets, uh, sorry, and true and false, again, these are selected response questions, people are picking options, um, and things like short answer and the numerical questions are less heavily used. At one level, that's quite disappointing. Um, I think it's changing over time. It will become apparent, um, not if not today, um, next time. I'm historically not the world's greatest fan of multiple choice questions, um, but I said that I've got older and wiser over time. And I think one of the things I've realized that is a well-written multiple choice question can do a lot. Um, it's um, Draper talks about the concept of catalytic assessment. In other words, it's a really, really simple thing but it can still drive quite deep learning. It can make people think, but it, it's, it's worth writing carefully. And a lot of the examples I talk about later on will be based around multiple choice questions just to get us thinking, but obviously think about an appropriate question type for what it is you want to do. So, so we're down, we're working through that list of things to think about in writing questions. And this is largely, this, this screen is largely about when you actually come to write a question, um, and it might seem fairly sort of obvious, but these things really are very, very important. So we've already talked about, you've thought about what it is you want to assess in this particular question. You've thought about what question type you might use. Um, make sure the question is not ambiguous. Um, it's quite funny given the complexity of that statement. Um, for example, if possible, don't use like a double negatives in it and just try and make sure that students will understand what the question is asking. It is amazing how confusing our questions can be to our students. Um, think about accessibility. I'm using the word accessibility in, in lots of ways. So think about how a student who um, is maybe partially sighted, how that would work for them. Think about a student who maybe doesn't have the greatest dexterity, um, how they would deal with it. But also um, think about students for whom English may not be their first language. Um, you know, will they understand it? Will they get what it is that, that you're saying to do? And indeed, people that are from a different discourse that, that don't understand the language you're using. So lots of things to think about there. Um, now, we've talked about the issue of, of there not being definite right or wrong answers, which is, is a, a very, a very good one. But stop and think, what answer is it that you're looking for? And actually, if you want, particularly if you're wanting to give targeted feedback, if you're doing a multiple choice question with distractors, um, what likely wrong answers might there be? And if you're wanting to give feedback, what feedback would you give? Now, we'll talk right at the end about some of the things that you might do as an anti-plagiarism device. Um, but one of the things that you can do is you can provide variants of questions. Um, start thinking now about the pros and cons of that. But we've talked about um, for numerical questions, you can fire up different numbers. I realise it's more difficult um, in some in some areas. But you can, um, for example, you could actually write several questions um, and have different, and the quiz can enable you to select different different questions to go to different students. Or indeed, if if um, one student is repeating the quiz they might get a different, slightly different version of it second time around. So there are ways you can do it. 
But the absolutely critical points are the bottom ones. And it, you could basically say it's check, check, check again. So when you've written something, check it yourself. Is it doing what you wanted it to do? Then get someone else to check it because we never see our own mistakes. And then modify, be prepared to modify them in response to what, what happens. Making this sound really hard work, aren't I? It's not, it's actually quite fun doing it as well. So this is the point at which I hand over to you. So I have a quiz for you. You may no might notice this is not written in English. It's written in nonsense language. But nevertheless, I think you should be able to tell me what the answer is to that question. Would you like to have a go and type your answers in the chat box, please? I think we're agreeing. I think it's coming in. It's D. It's D. Um, and actually, there's two reasons for that. Um, one is more obvious than the other. Um, the answers A, B, C and E are all colours, uh, whereas D is it's smaller. So there's a sort of clue there that is different. It might just be the answer. Um, but the main one is that we just can't stop ourselves. Um, people you have to explain yourself it's not good enough to say oh it's smaller it's just you have to explain why that is and you might laugh at these and some of the other examples and we'll move on to some real ones towards the end um but our head of assessment a few years ago tried a quiz on a course and got 60 something percent on it despite the fact he knew absolutely nothing about the content um, just by doing this sort of thing. You can get the answers, you know, so just be careful. Okay, the next one, this is harder. Um, you might need to say the words. Anybody, anybody feeling brave enough to have a go? Oh, it's coming. Excellent. Excellent. Well done. Well done. <laughs> this is great. Um, just in the interest of time, I, I, I'll explain it. Um, it's basically, I mean, if anybody wants to type in the text, you're welcome to as well. Um, but basically, it's that it, it would be an Elland, an Agenster, but it's a Tanag. So it's actually the only one that, that runs as a, as a sentence. So well, at least it's written in English, it's a bit depressing. Unfortunately, this sort of thing are incredibly common in the sort of quizzes that one has to take in, you know, doing GDPR training or fire safety training or anything like that. And I don't think it's just my employer. Um, you're looking for just one option. Yeah, it's E. And as I say, these are incredibly common. They drive me absolutely nuts. Um, you may or may not know that um, diarrhea can be a, a, a symptom of, of, of COVID. Um, it is one of the things that's listed. It's not the, the sort of common one. Um, but as soon as you've got past loss of sense of smell and cough, which are sort of well known, you know, it must be all of the above. So you don't actually need to do much thinking beyond knowing there's more than one to know the answer is all of the above. Incidentally, I don't particularly like questions where there's an all of the above. I don't particularly like them where there's a none of the above either. I think people are just, which of course is never the right answer or I've never known it'd be the right answer. Um, so in other words, people are sort of guessing the right answers without, without actually understanding what, what's going on. But with apologies, um, I am going to explain this one because I don't think we've got very many mathematicians in the audience. Um, what that question is asking you to do is to 
integrate a function, this squiggly thing before the 12 is, is an integration sign. And it's asking you to integrate 12x squared. Now, integration is the reverse process of something called differentiation, only integration is harder than differentiation. Um, I have actually just realised that there's potentially a, a double a double error in this question, that the correct answer is B. But the double way, the only way of doing it is to, you, you can do it, you can integrate it, but you can also do it backwards. You can say, right, I'll differentiate it. So rather than doing what we're trying to assess, and it's coming back to that, what are you assessing? If this question was assessing the skill of integration, then you not you don't need to do that. You can work through each of the options and think, is that the right one by doing the reverse process, which is easier. So using a model, although people say, oh, you know, this sort of thing, good for maths, that isn't because you're not actually assessing what you think it is you're assessing. But this one isn't particularly wrong but this we could do an awful lot better so um first of all what's the answer it's b it's water is hydrogen and oxygen um what do you think the problems might be with that question do do feel free to type words as well in the chat box <laughs> it's too easy it is indeed very easy suppose you'd known that it's hydrogen but not yeah it's it's it, this basically limited answer is a good one. Yeah, I think that's it. Basically, if you knew that what hydrogen was one of the options, you would be there straight away without needing to know about night oxygen. A much, much better way of doing this would be to use the, you know, this is where I can't remember the right question type, um, excuse me, as I confer on my note, the right name of the question type in, um, in your tool. Just so it's it's the one where you pick several options rather than the more multi-select that's it um and so you could say instead of that you could say which two of the following elements is what are made up of and then you would pick the two from the longer list the other issue which you could get there by process of elimination that's right um the other thing that um I think somebody's alluded to in the, you know, too few options thing is um, I need to introduce a concept called random guess score, which is the chance that somebody will get a question right purely by chance. That one clearly has got around, you might, you've got a third chance of just guessing and getting it right. So just be aware of that in that particular question. OK, these are meant to be easy questions. They're meant to be not real. They're giving examples. I will get on to some real questions in a minute. Um, so I would expect that you know the answer to that. Um, but <laughs> indeed, David, it's not cool. <laughs> um, the, uh, the capital of Ireland, I believe, is Dublin. Um, what? issues might there be with somebody typing a free text answer? In, th in response to that relatively straightforward question. Yeah, case sensitive spelling, spelling errors, in Irish, indeed. Yes, my husband thought of that when he trialled this through yesterday. Capitalisation. Right. So there's a number of um, those are all absolutely true. So you would need to deal with um, make a decision about whether you would accept uh, Dublin with a lowercase d. 
you would need to make it uh, allow for the Irish spelling. Um, the other one, which is remarkably common, and this is something to be aware of, um, capitalization, spelling in Irish can be dealt with relatively easily using the 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 the, the, um, the short answer question can mark in three ways. Capitalization and alternatives are easy. The one I'm about to tell you about is a slightly more difficult one, which is if somebody were to type it is Dublin or the capital of Ireland is Dublin. And people do. Now, one of the things you could do is you could make the box that they're typing into smaller so that they, you know, they get a clue that it's a, a short answer that they're looking for. We could tell them. Um, you can take out surplus words and surplus spaces, but it requires you to use something called regular expressions, which I know because I've used it can be incredibly effective, but it just makes it a little bit harder to use this sort of question type. So just, just worth bearing in mind. And th this is the sort of question type that we've used actually for marking sentences, not just words. But I think probably um, for the moment with the technology you've got, I would, I would stick with words. OK, this is I'm on to several that are real questions. Um, and this one is one that I've inherited. Now, I will just talk you through this question because it's hideous, um, as in hideously complicated. Um, it's actually a drag and drop question type, which is one that you don't have. Um, what you meant to do is to drag you know, the developments of Kirchhoff's laws to the right box and then develop drag each of those other ones to the right box and you can pick the ones that don't relate in this case to the understanding of gravity and I think Kirchhoff's laws is actually one of those so it would go there. Um, Cavendish's measurement of the gravitational constant that's got something to do with gravity but you need to put it in the right time order. Um, there are actually several things wrong with this question I will be taking it out from the assessment that I've dis discovered it in um, the first one's quite fundamental. This is a physics module. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a physics module. It's not meant to be assessing what happened when. It's not a learning outcome for that module. So it drove me nuts. The other thing is that I did a different variant of it. it it's got a good thing about it. It exists in several variants. Um, the variant I did was putting things that were to do with um, electrical forces in, in order. And um, I couldn't remember. So I Googled the, you know, when somebody had done it. It's a fairly legitimate thing to do in that circumstances. I'm just trying to find out. Um, and the order I came up with was subtly different. They were mostly right, but two of them were wrong. When you believe me, when you are so close to being right and some horrid computer tells you you were wrong, you are likely to be not very happy. Um, so just be aware of that. This ordering questions can usually mark by saying these two are wrong because it, it knows that it needs that one there, that one there, that one there and that one there. And if two of them are interspersed, it doesn't necessarily have the sophistication to tell you that. Um, I will just come back on the accessibility point because um, I think this is probably why Brightspace hasn't got a question type like this. Um, it does have a way of doing it. It has a way of ordering, but it's not by dragging and dropping. Um, and the reason for that is accessibility is absolute rubbish for um, it, the accessibility of drop, drag and drop questions is rubbish because you need to be able to use a mouse to, be, to actually drag that development of Kirchhoff's laws into the right box. So just, just be aware of that. Um, but from what I've seen of Brightspace question marks, you can do the same thing with drop down lists, which can be used by, by people who, who, who don't have um, the dexterity to, use, to do it in other ways. So um, not a good question, that's a real one. And yeah, the other thing that, that somebody suggested there, which is true, is that everything's directly related to everything else. And I think that's the other thing that students find really irritating when you're sort of somehow it, it becomes a challenge of logic rather than a challenge of what it's what it's meant to be. 
Um, this one, don't overthink it. This is a fundamentally good question. Um, it's asking people to come up with a numerical answer. It's got a problem. It's got a figure. Um, what sort of students might you need to just be aware of in doing a, putting in a, a question like this? Yeah, colour blind and indeed blind. If if students can't see that, they would they would struggle, or if they can't see the colours on it. Um, so um, we would operate that with a figure description as well. But the figure description, you might you might get around the colour blind issue because I don't think there's any reason for those being red. Um, but just the partially sighted, we would operate with a with a figure description. But then of course you have the danger that the figure description answers the question. So quite a lot to think about. Um, and the final question is um, also a good question. Um, it's one of the ones that I talked about that you can do. Um, you can give an answer and units and scientific notation, and that question exists in various um, in, in various forms. Um, I don't. There's one thing actually in the question I don't like, which is I don't want somebody to tell me. That I've got to use this information to calculate the volume of Mars, students would probably just go and look at the volume of Mars. So it's one of those things where you're wanting to try and give a realistic example, but people might not play with it. Um, the other thing, because I know, because I've just, th this one is, is well written, well written in a good question mark, that question type that does it properly. Um, but the correct units for this answer are meters cubed. And I've seen recently a question a bit like this, where it is currently accepting. If you remember, we talked with Dublin about the capitalization issue. The unit for a meter is a lowercase m. It's not a capital M. That is just plain wrong. If students gave an answer in a capital with a capital M, I would mock it wrong. But you need to make that decision and you need to just be aware, of, you know, of the things that people might do and, and the way that you would that you would mark it. Right. The final question for you. I have those final three. The last three have been um, based on my own experience. This one, I have to say, it's not anything to do with University College Dublin, but it, it is on a bright space development site. It's a real question that's given as an example there. Um, I can see two. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you. The answer to that. <laughs> In fact, it's turning grey again here. But um, yeah. So the fundamental issue is that it, it's it's inanswerable that the person that was doing this video is really funny. If you find it, I think you'll find it suited to his. He was just doing it as an example of a uh, yes, no, a, 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 um, a, a, um, a true or false question uh, and just kind of assumed that, of course, the sky is blue. And what happens if it's dark? And in any case, if you think about the, you know, the, the, it from a more sort of physical standpoint, the sky isn't really blue. So it's a completely naive question. Um, so, you know, it's the, one of these things where there's, there's, there's just not an answer to it. The other thing, of course, is just beware uh, true false questions because, the, yeah, exactly. How long is a piece of string? It depends. Um, the other thing is, true false questions coming back to this concept of random guess score you stand a 50 percent chance of getting it right just by guesswork so maybe a bit of fun a um, bit of fun to tear it to shreds certainly um but it's a you know ju just just beware that you don't do it because clearly they wouldn't have put out that video if it had occurred to anybody before it, it went up on the up on the internet Right. Um, for the final, you know, sort of active bit of this, and we will get time for a uh, discussion with with Mike's on in, in a little while. Um, I'm just coming on to this concept of cheating. And um, again, I've done a little bit of research before this. Um, 
about ways in which students might cheat. And I have advisedly used the word cheat on this screen. And uh, again, I found myself watching videos that I still feel slightly sort of dirty having watched. <laughs> Almost felt as if I'd been watching pornography or something on the internet. Um, because there were questions, I clicked on one of these videos, a couple of these videos telling you how to cheat one of these questions. There are hundreds of them if you look on the internet. Um, and uh, much to my surprise, they all tell you to hack into the code. Now, I have no idea how possible it is to get beneath the skin of the sort, any sorts of quizzes that, that you put out. Um, I, as I say, was was just shocked. I think I'm really naive. Um, but even if you're not hacking into the code, I think the important thing really is that don't make your questions so that the easiest way of answering them is to hack into the code. It's, you know, it should be assessing what it's meant to be assessing. I, I can't address that issue. It's there, you know, just be aware of it. It's what everybody thinks they might do. It's not the easiest of ways for somebody to cheat. Certainly, it's not the easiest way of doing a, a quiz. Um, the other one which I'm not going to address is the getting a friend to take the test. There's, there's much been talked about this in the distance learning community, um, that you never actually know who it is that's doing it. Um, there are, me, you know, there are means of doing it, this sort of facial recognition, um, you know, having a, a video going, those sorts of things, which then fall foul of GDPR. So it's an issue, um, but it's not the issue I'm going to talk about. The ones I am going to talk about are in the next little section are primarily um, talking to other students about the questions, looking at the answers, like I've just said, I looked at the answers when I wanted to know when uh, Copernicus did whatever Copernicus did. Um, so that's a sort of, you know, innocent looking up on the internet. Um, or indeed sending your answers off to an, an essay mill, um, a cheating website, you know, so somebody else can do it for you and paying them for it. Um, and the other one is, again, that differentiation integration question, you know, is where students can actually do the question quite naively. Um, that's the good point that's just been made exactly. Is talking to other students about the questions a bad thing? No, it's not. It, you know, it's it's something that, but we need to think about it. If if we're saying, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, if what we're wanting is students to talk to each other to help each other in their learning, that's great. If what your driver is is, can this student do exactly this and get such and such a score, then there's an issue. But looking for, uh, similarly, actually potentially looking things up in the internet, is this a bad thing? It's maybe what we want our students to do. So do bear that in mind that, you know, I'm not saying these things are necessarily a bad thing. I can see the point <laughs> it does say ways in which students might cheat at the end, but that may or may not be cheating. And I, again, we'll, we'll think about assessment design a little bit in the next workshop, you know, about that. Now, for the final um, section, um, again, I've gone on to one of the Brightspace designers website and things that they've suggested of ways that you can stop students cheating. And the options that they've given are options one, two, three and four there, um, which are introducing a very tight timing. We haven't talked about timing at all at the moment stopping students going backwards in the quiz. Um, in other words, making it so that you have to go through in a linear direction. And both of those, I think, are driving the same thing. It's to stop students having time to do that. Now, I would say that I don't think any of these are necessarily things that you do without risk. So I just, which is why I want you to think about it uh, in much the same way as the comments, you know, the comment that came in about is students talking about thing, I, you know, it, very, very good point. Um, you could choose to shuffle the questions so you can put the questions so that different students see the different questions in a different order. Uh, for a multiple choice question, you can randomise the order in which the options appear. Um, 
I suspect when that video was made, uh, Brightspace didn't have the capacity of using, uh, capability of using different question variants or, or putting them from a library, which is why I've added that in. So you can make it so that different students actually see subtly different quizzes. Um, and I think point six, seven and eight, I think, a self-evident, uh, something that we will, as I say, explore more in the in the next workshop. But it's back to this making sure people cheat if they don't understand what they're meant to do. Uh, I'll show you evidence of that next time. Make sure the questions are clear. Make sure that what you're doing is clear. And coming back to that point that, that's been made, and apologies for not naming the person who's made the suggestion, um, you know, <clears throat> What are you actually trying to assess? It could be that students talking to each other is fine. So just, just stop and think about it. But I'm just coming back to the top five things here. And as I say, they're not all certainly without their risks. And just for the next, um, we were going to go into breakout rooms. I don't think this time at, at this stage, um, David, would you agree? Does that, I think going out would be uh, silly. So let's just use the chat box. I apologise for that. Um, just for the next little while, just think about whether any of those might have issues. What things to be aware of in introducing various ones of those. And we will, in just a few minutes after this, we'll move into a session where we can discuss it more, more freely and um, we'll stop recording and, and allow uh, you know, people to speak if they, if they want to. So um, timing versus accessibility. Yeah, th timing is a really, really interesting thing. Um, uh, and the timing can be stressful. Yes, absolutely. We've had a real issue. Um, I don't know what um, provision you made um, uh, through the pandemic, you know, for, for remote um, conventional exams. We um, allowed 24 hours uh, for the first year. And last year, we put these quite tight windows on people. And in some cases, it's failed spectacularly. And I get that um, because 18 months or so ago, I was on some management course. And the first thing we had to do was these quizzes, these timed quizzes. Um, I'm a mathematician, stroke physicist, right? Um, I so went to pieces in this basic numeracy quiz that the findings from this survey were that my spatial reasoning and my verbal reasoning skills were very good but my basic mathematical skills were weak. This is very funny because um, this is what I've done for my life. This is what I teach. Um, and it was purely because I suddenly became aware that I was being timed and it was hideous. So we do, we, you know, we get into that. Yeah. So there's issues with timing. Um, there really is. I, um, can we just take the, um, has anybody any thoughts on this not going backwards through a quiz? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, I mean, is answering a question, you, you could say in some circumstances, fine. I think a lot of these things, it's a simplistic situation just to say, just do that. Yeah, this backwards learning, the, the, the point that was made just a moment ago was that if, if you're wanting it to build, if the whole thing goes together, the other thing, it can be really, really, really frustrating if you've given an answer and you go further on and then you just suddenly say, oh, for heaven's sake, that was wrong. And you just want to go back, you know, for goodness sake, let's treat our students as adults. Let's not, you know, let's not trivialise this. So I have real issues with those top two, I must admit. But I can nevertheless see that what they're trying to do is to just limit the time for people to do all of these you know, nasty things. They don't want to do it. Yeah, it's fundamentally unfair. And, you know, and I was really quite shocked. But I say that that's what what is being suggested in the video um, the, 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 the links on the previous page. Um, so the other things are really to do with this. Not everybody getting the same question. Um, so um, somebody said it's a lot of work. It is. It's more work for us if we're trying to do that. Um, 
the shuffling is an interesting one. Let's just stick for a moment in the one where actually the questions that are going to different students are different. What are the things do we have to watch in that? Dependent on how we're using the quiz. Equivalent difficulty, exactly. Yeah, it's that danger that they might not be of similar, they might not be of equivalent difficulty. I'm not saying don't do it. Um, yeah, you can't have a class discussion. That's really nice. I hadn't thought of that. No, if you're wanting to do this in that catalytic way, um, that students are then going to have a, a discussion. Absolutely. You know, so it, so it's there. So no, really, really good things. So I think basically all I've been trying to do is to, you know, may think about what it is. So could we possibly, uh, so just, just moving on. So that, that really has been the summary, the things that we've sort of touched on, and we'll have more time to develop those in the second webinar. Um, and that's the objectives for the next session. Just more importantly, um, I'll just quickly summarise what we'll actually do. Um, so we will actually, um, I'll start by um, actually showing you more of what I've done, real stuff I've done, not, not you know, made up questions. And also um, we'll look at some of the analysis we've done and the way questions behave, because I've had some surprises there, just, just anything that that can do to sort of inform your practice. Um, by some means, and I'm not yet sure how to make this work technologically, uh, we will have ways in which we can together discuss um, actual design of real questions, which could be questions you want to ask, um, or indeed assessment strategies. We could, we could do that as well. And then I will talk a little bit more about this, just the way in which the thing goes into your assessment strategy. Um, and that's where we, you know, we'll really sort of start unpicking the how you want to use the things and this issue of pass marks and other ways in which you can, other ways in which I've seen quizzes used in that way. Um, and as requested um, for the benefit of the recording, I hope that those are what the things that I've recorded to, uh, referred to. And thanks everybody and hopefully see some of you next time. I'd just like to say, uh, Sally, thank you very much for that. It was very informative and very useful and um, really appreciate building on your knowledge um, from your 20 years of experience in the yeah, Open University. It's, it's been really great. 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 So, you know, some of the examples were quite straightforward. Um, you know, that was deliberate, um, but we'll look at some real questions. And of course, the other issue is that, you know, I can ask maths questions and not everybody will understand yeah. them. And you can <laughs> likewise. So thanks, everybody. And thanks thank you. And um, just just to alert as well that there is um, a follow up webinar. I've put it there in the chat. It's also on our, our website. And to also alert, I think and Catherine has put it in the chat there as well. Catherine Murphy from IT Services. That IT Services are also running some Brightspace stuff, particularly around the tech technical side of it so that I think the link is in there too so 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 they, they are following up with some some workshops for the more technical support on this so so thank you everybody and we might see some of you at, at the next workshop and thanks David as well for your support in there as well today for the, the technical side so so thanks very much and we might see you on the some of you on the, the 16th of, of November for the next session so thank you for that take care <laughs>